Morning, everybody. Come on. Morning. It's easier if I come down here, actually, then I can see you all, you see. What happened in the front row? Did we all decide just to sit at the back? Um, some really good presentations this morning so far. I'd just like to say uh, on behalf of myself and uh, uh, Absence, uh, thank you to uh, Computer World for the opportunity to, to talk this morning. Um, thoroughly enjoyed uh, Joe's keynote presentation as well. Um, I'm here really to talk about end user computing. And I think for the most part, I've got quite an easy job. Uh, and I've got an easy job because I'm probably going to tell you some stuff that you already know and you're already aware of. But sometimes I think it's quite good just to stop what we're doing and think about what's going on with regard to end user computing and about how we can perhaps improve that from an IT efficiency point of view or improve that from a user experience point of view. And there's a lot of noise at the moment, right? Things have become, in my opinion, become far too complex. Our life has become really, really difficult. Yeah? There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of technology, for instance. There's a lot of demand. Our businesses are changing. We're trying to be more agile. We're trying to be more competitive. We come to events like these, and we're bombarded with different pieces of technology. And sometimes it's difficult to see the wood through the trees, if you like. And so I want to talk to you this morning about what's actually taken place at the moment when it, with regard to end user computing, and perhaps what are some of the things that you can do during the lunch break uh, when you go back today, when you go back to the office uh, at the end of the day, over the next couple of weeks, when you're talking to Computer World about what we can do to try and make sense of some of this. Um, Joe started to talk about the future of the user workspace or the future of end user computing, for instance, and about how it's all about apps and data. And I agree 100% it is all about apps and data. And if we could rewrite every single business line of business application we have today and put it into the cloud, yeah, or deliver it via a web browser, our life might be quite easy. The desktop and the operating system, for instance, might suddenly become irrelevant. Right? How we deploy applications would become irrelevant. Security would become less relevant. Our, our job might be easier. Unfortunately, we are in a world where we're stuck, at least in my mind until 2020 and probably 2025, where we've got legacy line of business applications and we do have to deploy and worry about desktops. So I'm not going to talk about the ideal and where we want to be. What I want to talk about is how we can actually bridge that gap today and what technologies do we have today. Who recognises this? Who wants to put their hand up and admit they've still got some in their organisation? Anyone? Good. One, two, three. It happens. We've got applications that we rely on. We've got devices that we rely on that still needs Windows XP. And application compatibility was a massive problem and a massive challenge when we looked at migrating to Vista or to Windows 7 for most of us, for instance. What's interesting is I like those days. I like the days of Windows XP. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been in the Citrix Terminal Services virtualized desktop space for about 16 years. Uh, I started with AppSense. AppSense were born out of one of the very first platinum partners in the UK that was deploying Citrix technology. So I've seen and helped organizations deploy a lot of Citrix, a lot of virtual desktop, a lot of VMware uh, uh, View, a lot of VMware Horizon, for instance, more recently. I've seen organizations move their desktops to the cloud, but it was a lot easier back then. I used to buy a PC. I used to put a build on it, a gold build of Windows XP. I used to install applications locally, and I used to give it to the user and say, off you go, I'll see you in about three or four years. And I used to manage what I would call a monolithic desktop. Yeah? It was made up of the device, the operating system, the applications. It might have had some file shares. Yeah? I might have had an S driver or an F S drive that I uh, uh, gave to the user. And I manage the user by proxy of managing the device or the operating system. Anyone disagree with that, by the way? Have I got lots of nods? I can't see. Is there nods in the room? Work with me on this. From a security point of view, 
I may well have put some antivirus on it. I may well have uh, set some group policies, for instance. And to Barry's point, I invested probably quite heavily in the perimeter, the egg example or the castle example, as other people will use. I invested in protecting the perimeter. Unfortunately, that world has now gone. It's not supported, and we know the world has changed. And it's quite changed quite considerably. And in fact, the workspace, I would argue, has evolved significantly in the last uh, two to three years. So first of all, we have more devices. We have things like BYOD. If you believe in BYOD, then fine. I don't. I believe in things like choose your own device and actual corporate delivered devices. But ultimately, we have a number of different devices that we can roll out to our users. We have a number of different operating system choices uh, we can have. Who owns those devices? How they're purchased, for instance, how they're financed can change. We have new operating systems from Microsoft and other vendors, for instance, but operating systems that promise to be more secure than ever before and to be more productive than any before. And really helpful things like Microsoft updating 250 million desktops in the home before we've had chance to update them in the enterprise. Yeah? We've got other challenges, though, when it comes to those operating systems because of how painful migrations are. How many people spent a considerable amount of time and money doing their Windows 7 migration? Yep. It was a painful task. And lots of customers I speak to at the moment say, we don't have the money, the time, nor the desire at the moment, at this moment in time, to go to Windows 10. So there's another challenge we have to deal with. And not only that, but Microsoft is changing how, for instance, they roll out the Windows 10 desktop. They're not just changing how they patch it and giving you larger cumulative patches. They're also changing how quickly they want to update it. They want to update it on a monthly cycle, for instance, with current branch. You might have challenges internally at the moment around, do I go current branch or current branch for business? Or are you like some organizations I speak to at the moment that are saying, actually, I'd really like to go down uh, uh, LTSB, for instance. Well, Microsoft won't recommend that. Yeah? That operating system is designed for things like ATM machines. It's not designed for businesses and enterprises to consume. So that changes how, for instance, we might manage our end user computing estate as well. And that's just Windows. We've got Mac, we've got iOS, we've got Android, we've got Windows Phone, for instance. Who knows what's going on with Google Chrome at the moment? Um, but we're having to update a number of operating systems consistently. We're constantly being told by our vendors that we need to update both the end user computing estate and the back end user estate. The way we deploy our desktops has also changed. We no longer just give someone a PC and say, there you go. Yep. We can do things like VDI and terminal services. Quick show of hands, how many people in the room have got some form of terminal services or RDSH in their environment? How many people have got VDI in their environment? And how many people have moved their VDI to the cloud? Not many yet. OK. It will come. It will become cheaper and easier to manage to move some of that workload to the cloud. But for lots and lots of organizations, and this is something that AppSense truly believes in, and something that I believe in for a long while, there is an and problem. Technology, I use this word, technology is evolving very carefully. Technology is evolving because nothing is being replaced. Yep. I've still got desktops. Oops. I've still got desktops. I've still got some VDI. And I will have some cloud. Yep. How many people have heard the term hybrid cloud? I hate that terminology. Why is the cloud a hybrid? My workspace is a hybrid. I might consume some stuff from the cloud. I might consume some stuff locally. I might consume some stuff on-prem. On That's the hybrid element. The cloud isn't hybrid. The cloud makes up part of the hybrid working environment. Applications. How many people in the room have got more than 10 apps? More than 100? More than 500? It happens. Some organizations have got thousands of applications in their organization. Some of them 5, 10, 15 years of age. Some of them 
as new, I keep doing that, some of them as new as these types of applications, Windows Store applications, iOS applications, applications that have been rewritten using APIs, for instance, and web services. But there's a lot of applications that haven't. And so now we have a number of different ways in which we can deploy our applications. Loads of people in the room have probably got SCCM. Some of you might have technologies like Landesk Management Suite and Altiris, for instance. Some of you may have looked at application virtualization, application layering. Every single one of these technologies that I get involved in never seems to be able to do 100% of all applications. I've always got that and problem again. So not only have I got a mix of operating systems, but I've got a mix of how I deploy my applications. Some things are installed locally, some things come via the cloud, some things are streamed, some things are virtualized. And then I look at the data. Data is everywhere, yeah? Lots of people talk about the need to uh, encrypt data at rest. I would argue that data is never at rest anymore. It's constantly flying, flying around. It's jumping from my phone to my Surface device to my Mac, for instance. Unstructured data is a big problem for organizations. And protecting data is going to become a massive problem for all of us in the room come 2018 with the EU GDPR. Um, and if you want to come and talk to me about that later, then please feel free. But we have a, an abundance of data, and users save, save their data in a number of different places. File shares and offline files and folder redirections are really ways in which we need to leave behind. There is what I would call the legacy. But what we've got is we've got consumers, tools like Dropbox and Box, for instance, that have come into our organization. And because we haven't provided anything better, we've now got things like shadow IT taking place, and we don't know where, for instance, some of our files are. So data is a big problem. Ultimately, the point I'm trying to make is what I've said already, which is we are in a hybrid world. And in fact, I would say we are in a constant state of migration with the changes that Microsoft are making, with the changes that the other vendors in our ecosystem are, are making, and the updates that are coming out, and the way in which our, users are, uh, our user working is changing, we are in this hybrid world. Yep. I lose devices. I need new ones. I move from a local installed application to a remote one. I consume things from the cloud. I consume things offline and online. It's very easy when we talk about VDI to forget about how do we manage, for instance, physical devices as well. It is a hybrid workspace. I also want to talk about our users. Have our users evolved? I would argue our users have gone through a revolution, not an evolution. Why? They're significantly more mobile than they were before. They expect significantly more than uh, we used to deliver them. Thanks to the consumerization of IT and things like the iPad, people are used to pulling an iPad from underneath the sofa now at home, turning it on, and it's instantly on. They're used to going to app stores and downloading applications and trying them and then saying, mm, that's no good, I'm going to delete that. They're used to saving files and getting access to their files across multiple devices. They're used to emailing and sharing things. They're used to fixing things for themselves, yeah? How many people, if you think about your support desk right now, how many times in today's world does it happen where someone calls up the help desk and instead of saying, I've got a problem, can you help? They say, I've got a problem and I tried these 10 things and it's still not working. And now the poor old support desk has got to go back and undo the 10 things that the users tried to fix themselves and get back to the root cause. Users have changed how they interact with IT. Their expectations are significantly higher. The generations, for instance, that are coming into our organizations are also changing things. My eight-year-old asked me the other day, what's Control-Alt-Delete? True story, yeah. Um, again, and it's not just about the younger generation, right? And it's not about the generation that's coming after them either. We all expect more. We don't, for instance, expect our logon times to be more than 20 seconds. We don't expect, for instance, to have a PC that I can't install iTunes on. Yeah? I don't expect not to be able to send the presentation I'm giving you now from my phone. I have a level of expectation. I know I can be more productive, and there are tools out there to do it, but sometimes IT tries to limit what I do. Many of you will be from different industries as well, and our industries will put 
regulation and compliance on us that will change the way in which we can deliver IT. They'll change whether you call your users users. Yep. Anybody in healthcare? No one in healthcare? Anyone? No. Oh, I beg your pardon. Your users won't be users, they'll be clinicians. They'll be doctors, they'll be nurses. The end user is the patient. This is a life or death situation. Yeah? We need to improve user experience and meet user expectation so that we can actually serve people better from a healthcare point of view. If, for instance, you are currently in retail, let's say supermarkets. I'm hinting here. Big supermarket in the UK. You may well be turning around and saying, we need to lock down all of our users immediately because we've just had to refund £2.5 million into people's bank accounts yeah? because of a cyber attack. I'm not going to mention any names, but it's not Morrison's, nor Waitrose, nor Sainsbury's. <laughs> Which takes me on to endpoint security. Endpoint security, what do I mean by that? I mean security on this device. How many people have got antivirus? Everybody's got antivirus, haven't they? Every, is that antivirus any good? Has antivirus had its day, perhaps? I'm not answering that question. I'm asking you that question. Um, but the big problem with endpoint security is literally the amount of ransomware attacks that are now taking place. I think Barry mentioned it before. If you're not familiar with it, you need to be familiar with it now. But ransomware is a big problem. On a daily basis, we are now seeing a larger number of ransomware attacks. And those ransomware attacks are not targeting your firewall. They're not targeting necessarily your web services. They're targeting your end user on a Windows-based device. 60% of all ransomware attacks in the last six months have come through via email. Are they any more complicated than they used to be? Nope. Uh, does anyone remember the Melissa virus, 1999? It's a very small batch file, came in via email. You double-clicked on it, and it went through the top 50 of your Outlook contacts and emailed itself out. The thing spread like wildfire. It went everywhere. It didn't hold anyone to ransom. It didn't do any damage. The guy did it for fame. David L. Thomas, I think his name was. And he got uh, put, into, put into jail for it and brought down uh, MSN Hotmail. But the ransomware that's out there today is no more complicated uh, than it was back in 1999. It still comes through via email. It's still an attachment. It's just an unknown executable that downloads a payload and zips up all of your data and then holds you to ransom and wants some bitcoins. And, 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 and. There's lots of examples. But the point being is the sophistication is it's picking on you. Lee Davies, yeah? <clears throat> and it's picking on you using social engineering techniques like, dear Lee, thanks for listening to my presentation this morning. Here's a copy of my presentation. Double click. Yeah? It happens on a daily basis. Happens to far too many organizations, some very, very high profile, some not so. Costs brands awareness and come 2018, with the uh, GDPR data protection legislation, it will cost you a lot of money in terms of fines as well. I mentioned the supermarket that two weeks ago got attacked. We don't know how or why. What we do know is they had to pay back 2.5 million pounds worth of money into their customers' bank accounts. We don't know or can't put a price on how much uh, that's affected their brand. What I can tell you is if it was 2018 and they were fined by the EU GDPR uh, regulation, it would have cost them 3.9 billion pounds. 10% yep. of, re of your revenue or a 20 million uh, euro fine. That's what it is come 2018 for losing customer data. It's not just a Windows problem either. We've got Macs. We've got other applications. Those of you that might have SCCM might be thinking, well, I patch my systems. I'm safe. I keep Windows up to date. I keep Office up to date. Look at those vulnerabilities there. They're coming from non-Microsoft-based operating systems and non-Microsoft-based applications. When QuickTime had a vulnerability in it last year, Apple on Windows, Apple's recommendation was, 
Well, just go and uninstall it off all your Windows devices. Oh, yeah, because that's, that's really easy to do, that is. Go out to every single device, find out who's got QuickTime installed, and remove it. So this whole end user compute delivering the workspace is difficult, and it's actually why the majority of the vendors that are here today and Computer World exists is because we actually have technology and solutions today that can help solve some of these problems. They can help solve the Windows problem and the constant migration. We can patch, we can secure, we can deploy applications in better ways. We can provide a single pane of glass. So how do we manage all of all of this technology, secure it, and still yet deliver a great user experience? Well, first of all, in my mind, and you may well have seen a slide like this before, we take something that's been around in the virtual desktop space for some time, a model, a methodology, and we apply it to all of our desktops, regardless of how they're being delivered. And what we do is we take this monolithical desktop that's made up of the operating system, the apps, the data, and the user, and we very simply try, where possible, to break it down into various different layers. Why do we want to break it down into layers? Because then these layers start to become interoperable. I can start to swap them out. I can start to change, for instance, the underlying operating system without affecting my applications, my data, or, for instance, my user profile or my user's settings or my user's experience, as an example. Every one of you that put your hand up earlier that said you've got uh, VMware for virtualization is already doing a form of virtualization here between the OS and the device, as you guys already know. But there are other ways in which we can abstract various elements. If you look, for instance, at what VDI does, it's abstracting, for instance, how the desktop is delivered away from the device so that I can deploy a Windows desktop down to a MacBook. Yeah? If you look at application virtualization or application streaming, it's doing a very similar thing. It's packaging an application once so that the underlying operating system can be upgraded or changed in the future without impacting or having to repackage that application. Stop using SCCM and packaging up files and tying them into the registry and the file system of this desktop and start using things like application layering from VMware uh, app volumes, for instance. Start looking at application virtualization like Microsoft App V. When it comes to data, do the same. How many people are looking at OneDrive? How many people have looked at other file sync and share utilities to actually give users a Dropbox-like or a box experience, but using a tool that is on-premise, yeah, or has got security and policy wrapped around it, so you can actually start to control it. That's something, for instance, that AppSense can help with. You can come and talk to us about that. And also, can I get to the point of managing that user independently? If the user has now got three devices, or 2.5 devices, if you believe Gartner, yeah, and we're in this constant state of migration, is there a way I can manage me instead of managing the device? Instead of managing that monolithical desktop, can I manage me? As I move from one device to another, can something dynamically configure and personalize and secure my environment regardless of the platform or the OS or the technology that sits underneath? And that is something that the industry would refer to as user virtualization or user environment management, for instance. So there are a number of technologies. I would argue I, I can't think of one out there at the moment that doesn't sit somewhere in this stack. They're either secure in part or all of this stack or they're delivering one of those layers. So I would urge you to come and talk to both myself at the AppSense booth, all of the other booths and Computer World about the various different technologies that can help with, that, with those layers of abstraction. There is no doubt about, in my mind, VDI could be seen as a bridge, as, though, as Joe referred to earlier, but the point is, is we're going to be in this hybrid world for some time, and VDI and virtualizing applications and desktops does provide a very good way of bridging the gap between, let's say, the new world and perhaps uh, uh, the old, and allows us to solve a number of different use cases as well. BYOD, remote working, business acquisitions, takeovers, mergers, rollout of new applications, for instance, domain migrations, Office 365 migrations, moving to the cloud, being more agile. 
It also is significantly more cost effective and it works. There are technologies here again today and technologies out there that improve, for instance, the performance of VDI. VDI 1.0 is way past us now. Yeah, it's not a, a economy-like experience on a plane. It is a first-class experience. In fact, I will quote someone uh, uh, yesterday on a podcast that said, with the NVIDIA chipsets, chipsets in VDI now, their experience on VDI actually supersedes what they get on their laptop. So there's a number of technologies there that can help with that. Look, perhaps, to some technologies, and VMware have one of these that start to combine, for instance, a new launch pad or a new workspace for your users that starts to help the user have a single pane of glass to bridge the gap between SaaS, on-premise, off-premise, local and virtualized. And also, whatever you do, come and speak to us and come and speak to all of the vendors and Computer World about how to protect the endpoint. There are a number of organizations now, the SANS Institute, the CIS, for instance, the FBI, CESG over here in the UK, uh, in Australia, the Department of Defense and the Australian Signals Directorate. They're all saying a very, very similar thing. Windows-based security is the problem of Windows engineering. It's not an InfoSec problem anymore. It's not a CISO problem anymore. It's us. It's for the, those of you that are like me that have been working in Windows desktop places for some time, it's our responsibility now to start to secure our Windows desktops against things like ransomware. And the way we do that is we have to patch. We have to do vulnerability assessment and patch. If possible, based on the recommendations from all of these people, we need to do whitelisting and actually control what a user can and can't run. And make sure that our users aren't local admins. So, as I said, come and talk to us, come and talk to Computer World. But just some final thoughts. Appreciate that this workspace now is heterogeneous. Start to look at tools and ask questions of the vendors. Does your product work across multiple platforms? Yeah, start to think about the term unified endpoint management. Is there a way in which I can manage all of my endpoints that I have, regardless of whether they're physical or virtual? Focus, as everyone has previously said, on the user. Consider virtual desktops and other ways of abstracting the various layers. Look at those other ways in which you might be able to deploy applications if you can't afford to rewrite them today. Security is not just for the InfoSec team. And where possible, let's enable our users. Yeah? and provide them a service so that they don't have to go around us and do things like shadow IT. So, I've covered off a lot. Hopefully that makes some sense. I'm around all day. I will, we will be demonstrating some of the AppSense technology later, so if you want to come and talk to us about that, then feel free, but hopefully that provided some food for thought. Thank you very much. <laughs>